Hey guys, yours truly Kevin Grace. I am here in Miami at Mount Nebo Cemetery. It's a Jewish cemetery here uh, in Miami. Uh, it's located off of Northwest 3rd Street. And I am here to pay my respects to a mob boss, a notorious one that is known throughout history in different movies he's portrayed uh, as just the accountant and some movies is portrayed as some kind of heartless killer so somewhere in between is the truth but the man that I'm talking about is Maya Lansky they will not tell you where he's buried here because the family does not want the public to know but I looked at uh, several different videos and I was able to kind of track down where the grave is and actually his original headstone believe it or not is at the mob museum which is in Las Vegas if you ever get a chance to go there you'll get to see their history of uh, organized crime and everything else so it's very interesting but anyway uh, Maya was born actually in Russia in uh, July 4th 1902 and his last name is not Lansky it's some long name that I can't say and I'm not going to butcher but anyway in 1911 he and his family uh, immigrated here to the United States to New York and in uh, about 1918 he started running with uh, Jewish gangs which included his friend Bugsy Siegel about 1920 he uh, became associated with uh, Lucky Luciano and out of that group he was kind of known as the financier so that's how his name became the um, uh, that uh, he, he became the uh, bookkeeper known as the bookkeeper but uh, later uh, about 1938 he was affiliated with the um, Bautista regime in Cuba with the illegal gambling down there and then in the 1940s he came to Vegas and he took over after Bugsy Siegel was killed and uh, helped with the Flamingo Hotel and in the 50s he got in trouble with gambling in uh, Arrowhead Inn up in Saratoga New York but uh, he was wanted for uh, to testify in, in different cases and he really didn't provide too much information but it's so much history on him and I know I'm going to miss a lot of stuff but I wanted to show you where his grave is most importantly so you can see where he's buried he was 80 years old when he passed away and uh, just buried in a simple grave and he said it was just a regular plain coffin so not this big luxurious uh, crypt that you would think but he's here and his son Bernard passed away in 1989, but this is Maya Lansky's headstone right here. He was 80 years old, forever in our heart. Just very simple, and then there's a family headstone here, marker. And you see a couple of visitors, which is a Jewish tradition to leave a stone, and I'll try to do so as well. And this is his son, passed away in 1989, but uh, I will try to add some video onto this as well if you like this video please subscribe down below and feel free to leave any comments about the great maya lansky also i forgot to um mention that uh he had toured the end of his life from suffering from heart disease chronic bronchitis ulcers um uh, and arthritis and then he wound up passing away, like I said, at age 80 from lung cancer. But uh, he is buried right here. If you do come visit his grave, and if you notice, the street is right behind me, one of the main streets. So also look for this little semicircle. And he's right across from the uh, Barker, Mr. and Mrs. Barker. So it's right here if you do come. Now, Lansky must stand trial next month in Miami on alleged income tax evasion charges. And in June, it's to Las Vegas where he must face profit skimming charges from the Flamingo Hotel Casino. Ike Siemens, Channel 4 News. He was a remarkable man whose life spanned a remarkable segment of American history and society. One of the most unusual things about him was that he lived long enough to die in a hospital bed of cancer and the complications of his 80 years. 
So many of his contemporaries, sometimes at his order or with his consent, died so much younger in terribly violent ways. Lansky's death, in many respects, marks the end of an era. The Godfather movies are great American classics, not only for marvelous writing, acting, and directing, but for explaining how organized crime was conceived and nurtured in 20th century America. Across the entire breadth of organized crime's history, from the early Prohibition days in New York City to Havana before Castro to the glitter of Las Vegas, Meyer Lansky was there in the shadows as mediator, accountant, advisor to the mob. Al Pacino, as the godfather, comes to Miami to meet with the family's casino consultant. The house, the neighborhood, the television turned up to shield their conversation from FBI bugs, all are taken exactly from the real life of Meyer Lansky. He was born Meyer Suchaljansky in Grodno, Russia. He came to Ellis Island with his parents in 1911 as part of that massive immigrant wave of Eastern Europeans. As a boy, he came to know the Italians, who would later become the bosses of the American Mafia. Yet Lansky was more powerful, more influential than any of them in shaping the destiny and enormous success of the National Crime Syndicate, America's largest single business. His position is even more astounding when you realize that as a Russian-born Jew, he could never be a member of that inner circle of organized crime, the Italian Mafia. He was a brilliant man who may have understood human nature better than Freud, a practical man of enormous self-control who, with patience and planning and cunning, manipulated people and fortunes and entire governments. He may have been worth a billion dollars by the time he died, but he was so good at shifting and hiding money, his investments may never be found. He drove a leased Chevrolet. Because he used sex and greed to get what he wanted from others, he never let himself develop those kinds of appetites or vulnerability. For him, money meant power and winning. He left school after the eighth grade. Always small for his age, he learned to survive on the streets of New York with his wits. First a floating crap game, then a car repair shop that specialized in changing serial numbers on stolen cars and souping up Model Ts so they could outrun the police. With Prohibition, he formed the Bugs and Meyer Mob. Their specialty was guarding shipments of bootleg whiskey smuggled in from Canada and the Bahamas. That was Lansky's first mediation job, trying to persuade the gangs they could make more money if they cooperated and ran their bootlegging like a business instead of constant street warfare. The bribe, he kept saying, is much more effective than the bullet. His partner in the Bugs and Meyer Mob was Bugsy Siegel, a handsome ladies' man. In the spring of 1934, shortly after Prohibition ended, there was a National Crime Syndicate meeting. With liquor legal, they had to decide what their next ventures would be. Bugsy Siegel was sent to Nevada, where gambling had just been legalized. Lansky's assignment was the Southeast, particularly South Florida and the Caribbean. Lansky had gone to Cuba in the early 1930s to begin a friendship with Cuban President Fulgencio Batista. The mob needed a supply of Cuban molasses for their distilleries. Lansky made the arrangements with Batista. By 1937, Lansky was living in Cuba. He ran the casino at the Nacional Hotel and the Havana Racetrack. When World War II shut down Havana tourism, Lansky moved to Broward County, where he began buying property that could be developed as nightclubs, hotels, casinos. Lansky never saw military service, but in the middle of World War II, he was tapped for one of the war's deep undercover assignments. Lucky Luciano, the most powerful of the New York Mafia bosses, was in prison. The OSS, later to become the CIA, approached Lansky, asking him to negotiate with Luciano. They needed Luciano's underworld connections to provide espionage intelligence on the New York docks and to prepare for the invasion of Sicily. Lansky arranged the deal. In return for the mob's help, Luciano was paroled and deported shortly after the war ended. In the late 1940s, Lansky achieved his first real power in the mob. His nightclubs and casinos lit up the skies in South Broward County. Bugsy Siegel opened the first hotel casino in Las Vegas, the Flamingo. But Siegel began to consider the Flamingo his own possession. He became erratic. The mob met and sentenced him to die. The night before a meeting with Lansky in Beverly Hills, Siegel was shot in the face as he sat in the living room of his movie star girlfriend. Twenty minutes later, Lansky's people moved into the Flamingo to announce they were the new managers. 
South Florida became Las Vegas East. The biggest entertainers in the country starred at Lansky's Old Colonial Inn across the street from Gulfstream Racetrack. Casinos were illegal, but law enforcement did nothing about it. Most law enforcement officers were friends of Lansky. Some had become rich investing in mob-backed businesses. Early in his life, Lansky had learned never to deal with anyone who would not accept a gift or a favor. In 1950, the Miami Herald ran a long series of stories showing organized crime's connection to the South Florida casinos and law enforcement's ties to Lansky. The Herald won a Pulitzer Prize, and Senator Estes Kefauver, until then virtually unknown, brought his investigations committee to Miami. The hearings were an immediate audience success. So successful, Kefauver went nationwide with his investigation and became famous enough to run for president. I'm not going to answer another question. You just says I'm not under arrest and I'm going to walk out. While Lansky was running his casinos in South Florida, Batista was thrown out of Cuba. So when the South Florida casinos shut down, Lansky went back to Cuba to arrange for Batista's return. In 1952, Batista and the army seized power, and Lansky could have almost anything he wanted, so long as Batista got a piece of the action. In late 1957, New York Mafia boss Albert Anastasia argued the mob had let Lansky become too powerful in the Havana casino operations. It was a simple business decision. Anastasia, one of the most feared men in organized crime, was shot out of his barber's chair in New York's Park Sheraton Hotel. Lansky's power was complete. When Castro shut down the casinos, Lansky moved to Hallandale to supervise the development of casinos all over the world. When the first casino in the Bahamas opened at Freeport's Lacayan Beach Hotel, all of those in management positions were old Lansky cronies. Much of Lansky's time in the early 1960s was spent supervising, from Miami, the skimming operations in Las Vegas casinos. Lansky became public enemy number one for a task force of FBI and IRS agents. They bugged casino counting rooms, secretly opened courier suitcases. In 1971, Lansky and two prominent Miami Beach hotel men were indicted for conspiring to skim $14 million from the Flamingo in Las Vegas. Lansky fled to Israel, but American law enforcement authorities applied so much pressure, Israel deported him. He flew almost around the world looking for asylum, reportedly offering $1 million to any ruler who would take him in. All refused, and Lansky returned here to be charged with contempt of court an income tax evasion. The skimming charge was dismissed after the Las Vegas bugs were ruled illegal. An appellate court overturned the contempt conviction. A jury found him not guilty of tax evasion. Lansky moved into semi-retirement in a Miami Beach condo. After open-heart surgery, he was less active, but the mob still came for advice and counsel. In 1977, his stepson, Richard Schwartz, killed a mobster's son in a fight in a Miami Beach bar. A few weeks after Schwartz was released on bond, he was executed in retaliation. Law enforcement officers speculated that Lansky was told in advance that his stepson would be killed. It was a matter of simple respect. He would understand and accept. To run a casino, you have to know how to get along with people. At that, Lansky was superb. He had three ulcers, but on the surface he was friendly, soft-spoken, easygoing. If you need a favor, come see me. Anything to help a friend. Scores of businesses in South Florida would not be here today if Lansky had not been there to help with a small business loan. Dozens of political careers depended on his money and connections. It was an offer they couldn't refuse, and they often returned the favor. He was a man of his word. A deal was a deal. Fifteen years ago, I asked him, when are you going to write your memoirs? He put on his best smile and said, there's nothing to write about. You guys make up all that stuff. But I know of no character in fiction who lived through as much intrigue in so many places with so many people as Meyer Lansky. On Miami Beach, I'm Clarence Jones, Channel 10 Eyewitness News. Mr. Lansky, why are the American authorities after you? Because a newspaper man started a campaign against me and it snowballed to such an extent that I guess it can't be stopped anymore. I was singled out for some reason. They needed an image. And this has gone to an extent 
where it just snowballed. And I don't know how far it's going to go. And when did the uh, snowball start falling? Well, actually, it started about 1965 when some newspaper man wrote an article that I have $300 million. Well, I wish I had a million dollars. I said, many more things, remember, have been said about me. They accused me of making a president. Now, I don't know Mr. Nixon any more than what I read in the newspapers. The closest I ever got to him is seeing him on television. They claim I have 50% of uh, Lebanon casinos, 50% of Monte Carlo. The Roosevelt sent me to visit Batista on a mission. Now, how ridiculous can we really get? This is just a global lie. Say it long enough and you'll get the people to believe it. So you feel that you're a victim of public persecution? I sure do. Mr. Lansky, what does the name Jewish Mafia mean to you? You know, I never heard that until I read it in the Israeli newspapers. Why, it's most ridiculous. Are there many Jews in the uh, gambling business? Well, when you say many, you'd have to judge by percentage. I think if you took the percentage of the gambling business in the United States, took the Jews, you would find them maybe in their proportion. Why is it said that you are the head of the organized crime in the United States? Well, that's the same principle that started the other gossip. That's most ridiculous. It's the news media again. It's the follow-up of the first thought. It was never said about me before years ago. All this came about just in the last few years. I didn't know as I was growing older it's going to get worse. Is there there an organized crime? Is there? I have no knowledge of it. Are you a religious Jew? No, I'm not a religious Jew. And what are... But I'm a Jew. In my heart. What are your connections with uh, Joe Stasher? Just friendly. Mr. Lansky, how do you reconcile the accusations against you in so many publications with your claim of innocence? How do I reconcile it? Yep. Well, it's from the same source. They started the publicity they could never stop. And I was told by a good authority that they'll never stop. They have too big an investment in me now. Now, I have been under surveillance for many years now. Maybe for the last ten years. And I'm sure if these men didn't find anything against me who have every, uh, every resource at its hand, they should know whether I'm in any wrong activities or not. They would know much better than the writers. Do you want to become an uh, Israeli citizen? Yes, I do. Mr. Lansky, did you invest money in business in Israel, do, or do you intend to invest money? No, I'm retired. And I would like to stay as a retired man in Israel, just like any other retired Jew.